We'd like to start our after lunch talk. I'd like to introduce the aesthetically pleasing Brandon Rhodes. <laughs> he uh, does consulting in his spare time, and his favorite Python data structure is the dictionary. And I'll just let him, I'll let him take it away. So a lot of the talks I give tend to be about other things, uh, how dictionaries work. Last year at PyCon, I did a talk on how memory works. But I thought it was time to fess up and kind of reveal how I work, how my mind works as I write code, because I realize there's like dozens of things that are going on as I write Python code that are the sorts of things that I rarely hear discussed. So I wanted to dive into them. Why do I write in Python? I do it because I find Python both beautiful to think about and beautiful to look at. And it's a combination of kind of two things. The language itself has some beautiful ideas built into it. But really, as a community, we additionally have figured out how to write beautiful code. If you've ever seen someone who's good at another language try Python, uh, it's easy to produce ugly Python, and yet as a community, we train each other how not to do that. It doesn't matter how beautiful the ideas are behind a programming language if its community insists on writing ugly code. It's the traditions and practices of our community that really make our code look like what we think of as Python. Why then is Python beautiful? It's really because of us, and so this talk is just kind of about one programmer's attempts to make his code pretty. It'll weave together two topics, language design, the stuff inherent in Python, and then some coding practices that I've adopted over the years. And you'll find that most of the language design stuff comes from math, and that the coding practices I use, I think, come from typesetting. Why math and typesetting? Well, because those are my particular background. You might love Python for quite different reasons, but telling my own story today, it's going to be math and typesetting. So first, a meta question. I have a question about your own thought processes. When you think about what occupies your mental space as you are typing code, what is it that you're thinking about? For me, it's kind of two things. Something I call my obligation stack, and then the code's visual layout, how it's communicating itself on the screen. Uh, what do I mean by the stack? Well, consider the moment when I type, start typing some code. This is a really tri trivial example, but it'll hopefully give you the flavor. If I say x equals, and my cursor is right there, the stack is empty. But as soon as I've added an open paren, I'm like, OK, don't forget the close paren. Don't forget the close paren. And then I have, might have a second paren I'm remembering, and then an open bracket. And by this point, the chances that I'm going to finish the line successfully have dropped pretty low. <laughs> and so what I tend to do is to try to keep my obligation stack short by keeping, I go ahead and type the closing uh, brackets. If, if, if it bothers you visually that they move back and forth, you can bump them to the next line. But I keep them there so that I'm not going to forget. And this, uh, I, I could make a big part of this talk, but I won't, won't. All the tricks I use to keep that list of obligations short, just going ahead and adding the import statement right now, rather than in a few minutes right before I run the code, stubbing out functions that I'm promising myself I'm going to write because I've just used their name, um, keeping even a little to-do list if I need to remember the two things I've got to tweak before I try running it. Often, I write a line of code with a print statement after it and immediately run it to see if it works. Ah, oh, then I add another line of code and see if it still works, rather than like writing five or six and then having to go back up to the first one and remember remembering what it was doing because it's raised an exception. In general, I try to keep from having to remember anything so that as many slots in my mind are free as possible to be thinking about whether the code will work. So sh for me, keeping a short stack makes focus possible. But once we're focused, what kind of code, then, should we be trying to write? So here's where we talk about Python and language design. Uh, my own background in computer languages is basically huh, basic. Microsoft basic, to make it worse. Um, followed by several years with C. Then awk, when I got tired of uh, type declarations. And then Python, because Perl never really fooled me. I, I could tell it was an imposter. <laughs> like, like, it was way more powerful than awk. <laughs> 
but I could tell that I just didn't need that kind of power. Um, there are a collection of other languages that I used in college and for small projects, and I should give honorable mention to Modula 3. In a programming language class, I did a report on it. I never used it, no one has ever used it, but it had a beautiful design, some of which, like interfaces and, and imports and stuff, went into Java, and a lot of it also influenced Python, if you read Guido's posts about the history of Python. So understand, Python's not radical. It looks very much like several earlier languages. Um, in fact, here is a bit of C++ code. Here is the equivalent Python code. What changed? When I translated this code from C++ to Python, what, I had to change the uh, syntax of how the comment is introduced, and uh, the if statement needed a colon after it in Python. But note that the rest of the code is just bare C++ code that just runs fine in Python. Uh, you might now have a question. Brandon, why are you translating astronomy code to Python instead of just wrapping the existing C++ library? And I should go ahead and admit that it's because uh, I maintain PyEFIM, uh, uh, astronomy library, and uh, Windows installation for people is really hard. They don't have Visual Studio Express. Amateur astronomers who are trying to like compute satellite positions, it turns out, are not typically coders. And so having an extension module in another language that they've got to get installed creates pain. And pain creates suffering. And anyway, so <laughs> I have undertaken a really big project and this is its first, my first public admission of what I'm doing. I am rewriting PyEFIM this autumn in pure Python. I already have re-implemented planets and satellites, this time breaking them out as separate modules you can use. Um, each piece, an independent package. In pure Python, I'm writing it from the ground up and testing it from day one, so the same code runs in Python 2 and 3. Won't require any extensions. It will use NumPy if that's available. And you might be thinking, Brandon, the reason that we do astronomy in C++ is because of a little thing that was mentioned in a talk this morning called performance. Well, I spun up PyPy that compiles your Python code to machine code as you go, and some quick measurements I made suggest that PyPy is in fact faster than doing astronomy with Python calling in to C because it compiles your Python to the equivalent C but doesn't have to then do the interfacing between two languages. So, if 99% of amateur astronomers will get their answer in under a second anyway and will never notice, for the person doing millions of, of asteroid, you know, animating the asteroid field or something, I'll tell them, use PyPy and it will behave probably faster than it would have if I'd kept C++ around. Uh, let me know if you're interested in astronomy. I might be doing some stuff with that during the sprints Monday and Tuesday. And personal aside. So, back to languages. Why do C++ and Python and C, Pascal, Java, and Algol look so much alike? Why is this valid code in so many of them? And it's largely because of this thing called math. Now, math is not perfect, and let me start with a complaint. I don't know if you've ever done a series of debugging maneuvers that involves a sequence of uh, instructions like this, but this actually really annoys me because when I go from the first to the second print statement, I have to uh, previous line, jump to the beginning, type dir paren, jump to the end, do close paren, hit enter. When I then have seen the objects inside of foo and I know I want dot bar, I have to go up, remove the parens, remove the word dir before I can append dot bar. Oh, it's a container. I want to know its length. I've got to jump back to the beginning, put lin paren, and I'm constantly having to jump to the beginning and end of each expression in order to modify it. What if a language's operations weren't so annoying? What if they just let you keep typing to the right instead of stopping to add parens at the beginning? You might have seen this approach in other technologies. Here are three. jQuery, for example, chains everything through a series of endless method calls. It uses chaining to kind of permit this, you know, just keep typing, um, and your expression gets longer and longer, and you never have to jump back to its beginning. If Python were more like jQuery, you know, it might have been designed where it looked like this, where I could just keep twiddling with the right hand edge as I explored deeper in an object tree. Um, a downside with uh, any kind of pipe or data flow uh, kind of syntax, though, is that you can't symmetrically express a binary operation. If you're going to have two things coming together to be added, 
One of them has to be the argument to the other, even if addition is a symmetric operation. Um, Unix pipelines now are a second, or, or pip lines apparently, are a, um, wow, this is a bad slide. I, the, the, I had to move to a Mac because of an emergency with my other laptop and it, my, my spell checker in Emacs isn't up and running on the Mac because I only had one day. Sorry. <laughs> so the Unix pip lines, um, initial data stream, uh, it, it, you get a data stream and you can just keep adding more and more and more commands to the end to put it through a series of transfer, uh, transformations. Interestingly, McElroy's original idea for Unix pipelines that the more reasonable Unix guys changed actually would have the line start with the input file, then name the transforms, and then name the output file without all of those, to him, ugly extra symbols that ruin the purity of his idea. Uh, as a historical aside, um, Donald Knuth once showed uh, uh, the most famous, I guess, of computer scientists his literate programming approach in a beautifully documented program, 10 pages of Pascal. McElroy was then asked to review that paper and not only pointed out a few bugs in Donald's admittedly beautiful code, but offered a bug-free alternative to those 10 lines of Pascal that consisted precisely of this with then six lines of concise explanation. And no one who's ever read that review seems to have forgotten the lesson that when you can do that style of programming where you just add filters and transforms to the right, your code is more easily reused and more robust than almost any other kind of code. So it's, it's a good way to design something if it'll fit. Pipelines are an alternative when you want more simplicity than just arbitrary math expressions. Finally, the kind of the, the c community that was into like uber consistency was the Lisp community trying to add things together with ugly infix notation like we're in the 18th century, not Lisp. Having function calls with a function name outside of the parens, not Lisp. In Lisp, adding three numbers looks exactly like calling a function with three parameters. Every single expression is a paren, some sort of function or operator, and then its arguments inside the same parentheses. Never any ambiguity. No reason for order of operations, because you can't have several operations piled together without parens around them. Each nested expression always gets its own parens. Um, Lisp code always happens from the innermost to the outermost. It doesn't need any rules about order of operations, because it refuses to special case the traditional math operations, but insists on one syntax to rule them all. So those three technologies, jQuery, Pipelines, and Lisp, are out there to show you how you can avoid the kind of uh, messiness that sometimes happens when you're throwing stuff on the beginning and end of a Python expression. But Python does this because it chooses to follow math. Math, as you add numbers together, fools you into thinking it's pretty and clean. You just stick stuff on the right, transforming your answer. But then if you want the logarithm, you find yourself jumping to both sides of the expression to express that. If you want to negate, you've got to do that on the left. Negation is not a rightmost operator. Math symbols just fly everywhere. Prefix, infix, function, uh, again, that it wraps the expression you've built so far. And because of this legacy, Python does have four main ways to an expand an expression and to help you big, uh, build more complicated pieces out of simpler ones. And because it doesn't always require parens, there is an order of operations that if you don't use parens, you have to have memorized. A lot of it's stuff you probably learned in school. In both of these operations, the multiplication part happens before the addition. Um, PEP8 recommends to us, and here we begin to get into this idea of visual layout, that you could lay out your code to make the order look obvious as well as be obvious to a person that knew the language. On bottom, you can just make it explicit with parens. On top, we just remove a little white space to remind ourselves that multiplication happens first. Uh, because they bind so tightly, PEP8 actually requires uh, PEP8 being the standard that we all follow, right, in writing our Python code. Um, PEP8 requires that there be no space between a name and the parens or the brackets that follow them. Another advantage that's kind of inherent in math uh, 
mathematics own syntax is what I'll call context freedom, a huge benefit derived from the syntax of mathematics. Python syntax is a context-free grammar. A given construct can have only one meaning. A famous example, a space and then minus b, where you forget the space, close paren, has only one possible meaning in Python, it's subtraction. But it can mean either of two different things in Ruby, depending on what it's learned. It's, Ruby's kind of statically typed, where it can see what the types of your variables are as it reads the program, and it has to have figured that out before it hits this statement to know what it means. Because Python is a context-free grammar, the meaning of an expression never depends on the types of the uh, variables. Um, and that grammar not only puts it in the mainstream of decades of language design, but it makes it easier to read snippets of code. You don't have to examine the whole file to see what A and B are to at least know what the expression's going to do. Now, my point, please, is not that Ruby people ever actually write ambiguous code everywhere and can't figure out their language later. They know to avoid a silly uh, expression like this where you've forgotten the space. My only point is that Python has an, a logical inner consistency built in, and if you happen to be mathish and sensitive, the consistency will make you happy inside. A big thing that makes me happy is the ability to take a part of an expression out and use an intermediate result. You can always evaluate an expression in Python part way and save the result. It's fairly obvious that if, that if I have a, an expression like the one at the top, I should be able to do the multiplication, save it to a temporary variable, and then go back and do the addition and still get the same answer. For many computer languages, this is not true of method calls. Um, you would think that spreadsheet dot look up its compute method, call it with D4, would be in all languages the exact equivalent of first getting spreadsheet compute and storing it to a variable, and then doing the second step of the expression. But appearance misleads. Both, for example, C++ and JavaScript, special case method calls as a special ternary operator that is not the same as doing the lookup followed by the invocation. This, for me, is one of the reasons why Python is so awesome. I don't have to remember special rules about when I can and can't pull the middle of an expression out. Like every other expression, you can save a not-yet-called method or pass it to someone as a callback. <sighs> Consistency. Now, there is one final benefit that we should mention of Python's having a generally math-friendly syntax. Just like a math paper, a good mathematician defines the symbols and operators uh, that he or she is about to use, Python makes you import the things that you need. Explicit import means you should never have to search your entire code base to find a stray definition. Um, a note, please remember about import that the simplest form of import, like import piano, expects you to then qualify each class and function you use with a module name, piano.bench. Please don't think that everything in the piano module needs piano in front of it so that it's a piano.piano bench. Because we have this ability to qualify things with the module name, you don't have to qualify them with extra words to make your symbols extra unique. PEP8 specifically recommends this. Uh, looking at a, a traditional C library, the X11 library, it says, uses a leading X for all of its public functions in Python. This style is generally deemed unnecessary. For example, the logging module in Python both gets this right. It's not a logging handler and a logging filter and a logging logger. And then gets it wrong with the record. You win some, you lose some. The modern JSON standard library module is such good practice. It just has load S and dump S not JSON load S and JSON dump S that duplicate, duplicate the name of the module. If you keep your names short in your module, you leave the caller in charge of whether to qualify all of those little names with the module or to just import them and remember where they come from. While we're on the subject of imports, I used to be really annoyed by import loops where module A needs something from module B which then tries to import something from A. But I've come to suspect that an import loop, in fact, often indicates to me a failure to carefully architect my code into proper layers. If you use, uh, go look this up later, if you use things like dependency injection to keep higher level code in charge of simple lower level modules that don't know about each other or about the higher level module, then I find that import loops just don't occur. Anyway, 
Those are some of the benefits that Python inherits from the traditions and the notation of mathematics. And so now we get to talk about typesetting. I have to confess something. I compulsively refor reformat paragraphs by hand to make them look good. Depending on the line length, the browser might split a particularly difficult paragraph so long and short lines interleave. You can see that I've let it do it here, because particularly is a very long word. It went to the next line early, and so you have a long line, followed by a short line, followed by a long line, followed by a short line, and it's, it's all ugly. So what do I do? I tend to break paragraphs manually. I just go ahead and get that word length. Ah, behold the majesty. I just get that word length and move it down early, even though it would fit on the first line, so that all of my paragraphs always have a pretty monotonic shape, increasing in size, and then <laughs> decreasing to their end. Um, I similarly reformat email paragraphs, and I made a recent discovery. Many email clients today reformat plain text email and rewrap my pretty paragraphs themselves. In such cases, my carefully hand-wrapped paragraphs are for naught. How many, my friends, my family, how many of you use real email clients that keep 80-column plain text emails pristine in a natural fixed-width font? <laughs> anyway. So where did I get so interested in typesetting that I compulsively reformat email paragraphs that no one but me will ever see, and, and the three of you? Thank you. Well, it was because when I was a kid, my dad, who was uh, doubly working at Bell Labs, had this book, which he'd picked up after uh, Don Knuth spoke at uh, Champaign-Urbana, uh, about a new typesetting system he'd written. Um, his publisher was cutting costs, and so volume two of his life work, The Art of Computer Programming, looked pretty ugly. And so he invented the tech, which is the Greek word we get technical and technology from. Uh, he created a typesetting system called tech uh, intended for the creation of beautiful books. He built the whole stack by himself because no one had ever done this before. He had to invent fonts, invent font rasterization, plain text markup, device independent output, and printing. These days, you'll note we use the same stack, elements that are descendants of what he did, though today it's all a different set of technologies. By doing a full stack from designing a typeface in a computer for the first time, to inventing algorithms for page layout, was quite a challenge for a mathematician and computer scientist. He says, talking about the font invention, then there was the letter S. None of my mathematical formulas would handle it, and I spent several days without sleep up at the lab. Uh, Donald finally came home and showed Jill the results of his first three days and nights awake, and her comment was, why don't you make it more S-shaped? <laughs> uh, this is the font he designed, a little sample. You can see he finally did something interesting with the S. Um, his book about typesetting taught me from like when I was you know, early in high school about the beauty, about the differences between the hyphens and the different kinds of dashes. I'm so happy Unicode has come along because I can type them again. Um, Knuth immersed himself deeply in the history of typography. Um, and, and came up again with this language, this markup language, uh, whereas we these days use angle brackets, he used backslashes. Uh, notice the, um, this, there's an Easter egg I found when I was reading the source code to his book about tech here. Uh, you can see the era it's written in when he says that uh, the computer's memory capacity might be exceeded if you're typesetting the works of some philosopher or modernistic novelist who writes 200-line paragraphs, and then he secretly in, creates an index entry to this paragraph under Joyce, comma, James that you only learn about if you read the source code. In fact, he used backslashes so much that I'm sometimes tempted to, to define tech as a computational engine for converting backslashes into beautiful documents. As a personal aside, um, I need at the moment to design a book, but it's been years since I've been able to bear to make myself use tech so I've actually started 
a new project. I call it bookbinding. It turns text into paragraphs and paragraphs into pages in Python, then draws them to a real PDF using the Report Lab library. Python does, if you look, you might need it if you do a lot of stuff on the screen, have a built-in uh, text wrap module for splitting paragraphs into lines. But its uh, algorithm, which is really designed for monospace, is too simplistic simplistic for professional quality, so my new bookbinding module uses the same high-powered typesetting algorithms originally developed by Knuth for tech. Uh, a lot of the work had already been done because in 2001, Andrew Kuchling had written TechLib for Python, which I think I might be the first user of. <laughs> Let me know if you're interested in taking a look at it, you know, during the sprints. End personal aside. So, typesetting, Knuth. With all those backslashes in tech, you might not think that Knuth would have any real good advice for writing beautiful Python code, but remember, Python code is based on the syntax for math, and Knuth became a world expert on how white space should be used when laying out math. In the code that you write to make tech produce this gorgeous, gorgeous formula, Notice there's nothing in there about spacing. I just described the series of characters and operators, and it knows that when you take x to an exponent, they go close together because that's a tightly binding operation. It's even tighter than multiplication. But that when you have a big set of parentheses to an exponent, it needs a little more room because it's such a big thing being exponentiated. He learned all of those hundreds of little rules that typesetters had been using for centuries without really necessarily having expressed them, and he made them all a part of this system because he knows how to make math look good. White space, expressions, beauty. You think of Knuth, but you also think of Python. So, that brings us again to considering PEP8, because you can think of PEP8 as a set of compositors' rules for how to typeset Python code on your screen. As an example, PEP8 specifies the basic shape of a page of code. It says simply, limit all lines to a maximum of 79 characters. This is an exact analog to the standard advice of graphic designers that paragraphs are easiest to follow if you don't go beyond 45 to 75 characters. If you've ever like visited a GNU page, which are like as wide as your browser because they were written 10 years ago, like I often, it takes me a moment to find the beginning of the next line because it's so far over. The advice that we have from PEP8 about Python keeps us from doing that in our Python code. Now, how, do, how then do we handle this line length restriction when we often want to write things that are longer? When you reach the right edge, you might just be tempted always to wrap a Python statement across several lines of code. So a first trick that I use is these days I often try to introduce a new name instead. Here is a method call that's two lines and if it's got to be two lines anyway, why don't I just get the biggest expression, give it a name, and therefore make the uh, function call actually look like a little function call? Naming intermediate values like this, message here being the intermediate value, not only removes the ugly hanging indent, look, the left-hand side's all at the same level, but you've actually added documentation to your code. There's now a name for that string you created, which gives you a little hint about what it's being used for and why it's being passed. This is actually an idea that I picked up from those uh, extreme programming guys. They tended to use variable names to destroy all comments. Like if they saw code like this with forces redraw, reminding us why we use the word true, they destroy the comment add another line of code, and document what the meaning of that variable is with an actual variable name that they believe will be maintained better than a comment. Now, XP people also point out that big section title comments can often be replaced with a function. Um, if I have a big, big function and there's this section of it called open the barn that does some stuff, they would think that that's a prime candidate for just getting rid of the comment that tells us it's opening the barn and actually make that the name of a function that does the same thing. The XP movement sometimes took it too far, but I do really love using more names that usefully replace comments I'd have to write anyway, or that let me avoid really long lines. Uh, so um, if I have a comment like this in the code, react if window too tall, 
I very often now will just instead delete the comment, pull the value out, and call that Boolean too tall, and then I can if on it, and it's easier to throw in debugging statements later because I have a name for that quantity if I want to see if it's coming out to the right value. Another traditional typesetter goal is that the page should be an attractive block of text without what compositors call ugly rivers of white space spilling down it. William Morris was famous for how he would labor on his printed pages uh, to make them look dense like just a solid block of gray when you stood at a distance from them. Attention to space, similarly, also really helps the look of our code. PEP8 says extra white space to align variable values like this is forbidden. Because what does it do? It creates these big gaps of, of, of empty space in the middle of our code, whatever its other advantages might be. Another layout idea that I use comes from uh, Linux, uh, the inventor, uh, Linus Torvalds. Uh, Torvalds wrote the masterful document, The Linux Kernel Coding Style for the C Language. He says, now some people will claim that having eight character indentations, which is what he uses, makes the code move too far to the right and makes it hard to read on an 80 character terminal screen the answer to that is if you need more than three levels of indentation, you're screwed anyway and should fix your program. Uh, and I actually kind of agree with Linus here. With each year that I keep programming, I find more and more value in code that stays close to the screen's left margin. My indentation settings, as per PEP8, are four spaces for Python and at least that for other things. I do let myself go to two spaces for HTML because Web pages just nest deeper than code. Um, but I keep it at four spaces, and if it starts getting too deep, then I change the code, not the indent. Uh, one thing I can do, and I, I, it, I always, eyes would light up when I showed this at Python Atlanta meetings, this seems to rarely be taught to beginners. They're told what continue does uh, right in the Python uh, tutorial, but they're not shown its most common use, which is often when you're iterating over a sequence, you only want to touch some of the items, and you can get several layers deep before you've computed all the intermediate values and decided whether to process this item. So your actual processing code, which, which tends to you know, be 30 lines rather than item dot do something, can wind, half, wind up halfway across the screen, giving you almost nothing to work with. And so what we've done since, uh, what the continue statement really lets you do is invert those tests and toss out items by saying, oh, it's not valid, continue back to the top of the loop. We'll not even talk about it. And so then when you finally get to the important code that runs on the valid items, it's only indented one level. And that buys you a lot of room. Uh, another thing I often do is factor out a new method. If I find myself really deep inside of uh, some for loops and if statements, so I have a big block of code that's that far in, I'll just give it a name, break it out as a method, and then all of that code gets a lot more space to breathe down in uh, what here is called uh, this finalized method. But I then go a step further these days. If self isn't involved, I ask, why make the routine a method? I mean, look at this again. I, I, I have now like this spidey sense that makes me look at finalized widgets and say, wait a minute, there isn't any reference to self inside of this purported method. If there's no reference to self, it's not a behavior of the object because it doesn't know anything about the object. And so I now pull those out as plain functions to the top level and my testing, you know, all those little things that are supposed to work better when you're coding well, it suddenly is easier to write tests for this. It suddenly carries less state. I can suddenly reuse the code more easily from elsewhere. Watch out for when you think you're writing a method, but there's no reference to self. Um, that, by the way, is a, this, by the way, is a significant way that Python, I think, has been training its community. I think of Python as this force that by being beautiful in some cases and kind of, uh, difficult for us to use in others is slowly channeling us into better and better use of the language. Uh, this idea of just doing functions. Django made mistakes, but it's far more Pythonic than many competitors that were made, invented the same year, because it recognizes that a web view can just be a plain function. 
Uh, and then finally, a neat maneuver that you can do in Python when you have, again, like a series of for loops and then some work to be done inside it, is instead of factoring out the operation inside the loop, it might be more reusable to factor out the iterator, which Python uh, lets you do with the yield statement. A lot of languages don't allow this, and it's a neat thing if you're often going to be wanting to go over these objects in this deeply nested order. Uh, factoring out iterators to keep code shallow is really a Python superpower. Another source of ugly white space is large function calls, and unfortunately, this is how PEP8 recommends that we handle them with this big, ugly amount of white space under the function name. This brings us to what I call the five, sta five stages of function call grief. You start off very brief. You go a little beyond 80 columns, so you do the ugly indention thing. And then you experience what I call the leftward collapse, when it would take three lines to do it, so you say, forget PEP8, and you move everything just like four spaces in. You then experience, or might encounter, argument ballooning, where suddenly the arguments, they involve expressions or uh, things like that. And then magic happens. You finally just throw down your hat, and you put one argument per line with every single one of them ending with a comma, and suddenly they're utterly symmetric. Argument per line is awesome. Every argument looks the same, and it makes the lines orthogonal in version control. Why would adjacent lines not be treated separately by your version control? I'll mention this in case you haven't seen it. Uh, this happens when adding or changing line in of your program requires another line, typically the previous one, to be modified. For example, most languages today use a statement separate terminator, but Pascal instead used a, sta a semicolon as a statement separator. So to add a last line to your function, you also had to add a semicolon to the previous line, which means your version control thinks the last two lines of your function have changed. Um, the C language actually made this mistake with when you're doing like lists of integers that you sort vertically, it doesn't allow an extra terminal comma. So if you add another number to the list, you get two lines that appear like they've changed instead of one. Guys, if you ever design a language, make sure that every construct that can span lines allows utter symmetry between the first, middle, and last lines in the construct. Python always gets this right because Python is so awesome. All of our data structures and things can allow every item to look the same. So option number five now, bringing it back to big function calls, Argument per line makes version control happy. I don't have to modify any of these lines to add another argument. Uh, I sometimes do make exceptions, like if x and y are parameters that can be grouped logically. But many experienced Python programmers immediately now, the moment they hit column 80, just snap into argument per line mode with a lot closing paren on its own line, which means that the Python community is now developing new practices. PEP8 wasn't the end of what we could find to make our Python code beautiful. I found this out when I tweet, I, I noticed in July, look what I'm doing. I'm always like making, you know, doing one argument per line. And I tweeted about it and like Carl JM, who's the guy who maintains PIP, and Jonathan Hartley tweeted back, oh my gosh, we do that too the moment we hit column 80. And I discovered that we have a new practice in the Python community. Does that mean we should go try to edit PEP8? I don't think so. I think it's useful as a common denominator. Even with what it's got in it, it's hard enough to get some projects to adopt it. But we probably do need to find some new way to communicate these ideas when we run across the fact that several of us have the same coding habit. So lists separated by commas can be pretty. What happens when you have operators? Here, PEP8, I believe, is actually harmful because it says break after the binary operator, as here in its example. How do I know that that's bad advice? Because of Knuth. Knuth, remember, is the epitome of typesetting in math, and it turns out that he's written hundreds of pages about formatting expressions in his typesetting books. What's his advice? It's quite an art, he says, to decide how to break long displayed formulas into several lines. It's often desirable to emphasize some of the symmetry or other structure that underlies a formula. Then he lays down the law. Displayed formulas always break before binary operators and relations. PEP8 tells us to do something bad. Here, our eyes have to bounce back and forth to find the pluses and minuses. 
and they're difficult to locate. If we follow Knuth instead of Pepe, not only is it easier to read, not only is there this beautiful ver vertical symmetry between terms, but the subtracted terms actually look negative. Did you notice on the previous slide, the minus signs were up next to the previous guys rather than being next to the terms that were being negated? So there are long traditions in math that can help us improve how we write our Python code. What about method chains with people writing ORMs everywhere? The question that jQuery tackles of chained methods does keep coming up. I never use black backslash continuation, so I need another way to do them. Um, so I used to for a little while. I closed each method on the next line just so I wouldn't have to type the backslash. Uh, then I figured out I could put parens around the whole expression and uh, have uh, stack up the methods that way. Then I figured out I could move the dots to the beginning of the line. And this is actually my favorite one because the version control will be happy that when I someday add a fourth method to the stack, I don't have to go put a period at the end of the previous line and change two lines when I'm really changing one. Method chains still are an emerging practice. I actually sometimes just use an intermediate variable to avoid the entire issue. Uh, so I'm not sure what to recommend, but those are my favorite practices. So anyway, to be happy like me, make code pretty. When I'm at work, I do avoid just going through a module needlessly and rewriting other people's code willy-nilly if I've visited the module just to do something specific. But if I do touch a line of code in the course of my duties, I'm always trying to find the next tweak to make that section of code really beautiful. So I would like to suggest for you a little bit of homework uh, now that I've gotten you thinking about this, and now that I have admitted to you my obsessive ways of constantly fiddling with working code that I have in front of me. First, it's always good to go back and reread PEP8 sometime this weekend or early next week. Because it's like, it's actually a good document just about making your programs readable in general. Read Linux Torvald's Linux kernel coding style. Uh, next, I think we should be uh, getting these stories together somewhere, kind of a beyond PEP8 document that could explain a lot of ways since PEP8 that we've been introducing even further conventions. So sometime during this weekend, or email me, tell me some refactoring stories in the way that you like improving your code. And finally, I and a few other guys have been thinking, what if there were like a little YouTube channel that was like Car Talk, but for code? where a distressed open source project could say, this Python module, it works, but it's just awful, and we don't know enough to fix it. And what if a few genial guys were to sit down and spend 20 or 30 minutes commenting on it and coming up with this, these ideas that are second nature to us and that might really help make the code more readable? If you know of a project in such distress that might be a good for a pilot program, talk to me later. And thank you very much. Thank you, Brandon. That was awesome. We have uh, time for a question, or possibly two, if anyone is interested. You can come up to this microphone, right? Uh, me and a work colleague uh, were really uh, anal retentive, and uh, we put uh, PEP8 and PyFlix in our CI, such that uh, we have nice graphs whenever somebody makes coding standards. Do you use linters in any way? So the question is, do I use linters uh, from someone whose team uses both uh, PyFlix and the PEP8 checker? Uh, because I disagree with PEP8 in several cases, I use PyFlix, also the PEP8 checker is a lot slower Maybe on modern processors, that doesn't matter as much. I should try it out. But I have uh, PyFlakes hooked up in Emacs so that the moment I make a mistake, the line turns red. Because uh, good Python code, even though it aren't static declarations, a good checker can notice, well, you're using this foo variable without any imports or definitions of something called foo. And it, it, before you even try running your code, the, the, as you type it, the line will just light up as, as this isn't valid. And that saves me probably about half of my, it feels like I'm about twice as fast now that all of those mistakes get caught just as I'm hitting save before I context switch out of the editor to try running it. So PyFlakes has been huge for my productivity. Sir. Uh, 
Hi. Uh, great talk. Thanks. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I've been finding that I'm doing lately for large function calls is making tuples and dictionaries and unpacking those. I just want to get your sense of how you think that looks. Um, the, so the, the question was, what about when you need a really long argument list and so you just build either a dictionary of keyword arguments or a list of um, listed arguments in order to then use the asterisk notation to pass them into the function. Asterisk notation always to me has a slight point against it because it's conceptually hard for new programmers and it's a little bit ugly. It looks like C code intruding into the middle of my Python. But I do sometimes use that and I always use that when some of the arguments are conditional. Because if I'm building a dictionary of parameters, I can then have an if statement about whether one or two last things get thrown in. And that's just a mess to try to do in line literally with changing them to nuns using some ternary operator or something. So I especially love that if there's a big group of them that I need to conditionally uh, edit before passing them to the function. One last question. I can, yeah. So hi, I'm Alex. Um, about the line continuation with the backslash and the dots beginning of the lines, now, do you think we could propose that so that every line that begins with a dot eat the return, the, the carriage return from, from before? Because no statement starts with a dot. The it? problem is that you, so, or, so the problem is that um, dot three is a valid expression in Python. You could make the rule that, it, that if the next line just starts further in, and I didn't end with a colon, that it's a continuation, but all of those things involve tricky exceptions if you think about them enough, and so Guido has always just said no to us. <laughs> oh, the question, I'm sorry for the uh, recording. The um, question was, why doesn't Python just know if you start the next line with dot method name paren, why doesn't it just know that that's automatically a continuation? And so I made up an answer. <laughs> See you later. Thank you. So uh, we'll have a 10 minute break. 10 minute break and then we'll resume talks here with configuration management with Zookeeper.